Out of all the Jerry's in the world that get a lot of credit, there's one in particular that's played a huge role in shaping some of the most formative music of my life, and that's Jerry Finn. His impact as a producer and engineer is the glue that holds together the foundational soundtrack to so many people's lives, including my own. The lion's share of records critical to the pop punk and punk rock genres, and honestly some of the best just straight up rock records, are produced and or engineered by Jerry Finn. Green Day's Dookie, Rancid's and Out Come the Wolves, Enema of the State by Blink-182, All Killer No Filler by Sum 41. We could make an entire video or videos about the impact of these records alone. But the reality is Jerry Finn made a ton of music. And no matter how big or how small the band, his sound and legacy can be heard. So in this video, we're going to take a look at the highlights of Jerry Finn's incredible recording history. Talk about some of the gear and techniques he deployed to bring these records to life. And most importantly, the mindset and spirit he brought to the music production process, which is something we can all learn from no matter what kind of music you like. So, let's go. What's up everybody, how's it going? I'm Brad Dollar, welcome to the channel, it's excellent to see you. While we're here, if you have some time, please hit the subscribe and like button. It does a ton to help the channel and I super appreciate you for doing it. So let's start at the top. Who is Jerry Finn and why do I feel so motivated to make a video about one single person? Jerry Finn is the producer and engineer that shaped the sound of what we know as pop punk and ultimately modern rock. His career had a consistent duality as he grew up playing punk rock music while also establishing his path in the music industry by climbing the traditional recording studio food chain. Long before he cut any of the huge records that he's known for, he was blending these worlds of super high end and super DIY at the same time, which definitely shows up in the authenticity of all the music that he made. So while we're here, let's talk about some of those records for a moment. Love Him or Hate Him, these are definitely transformational albums and songs for people, and honestly for the rock genre as a whole. Even if I'm only speaking for myself, I think I'd be a little lost without some of these albums in my life, especially in terms of music as they were and still are in some ways, a bright north star for me to follow. There's Dookie, Enema of the State, All Killer No Filler, and Out Come the Wolves as we mentioned earlier, as well as AFI Sing the Sorrow and December Underground, Alkaline Trio's Good Morning, Hit or Miss by Newfound Glory, The Kids Aren't Alright by The Offspring, Jawbreakers Dear You, Bad Religions The Process of Belief, Wiretap Scars by Sparta, About Time by Pennywise, and Lycanthrope by Plus 44. These records are just a tiny, tiny sample of the breadth of Jerry Finn's work, but it's a great place to pick up and start listening to the sound that he's so known for. Jerry's path also includes a bunch of albums and music that aren't pop punk or rock at all. He got to work on music with Taj Mahal, Maria Moldar, and Wendy Moten to name a few and later even working with Morrissey. This was his path coming from the big studio world. As a result, he knew how to bring the polish, how to bring the pop, how to really dial things in to be accessible. And that's what Jerry Finn was such an expert at, making music accessible without losing its edge or its magic in the process. And most importantly, the authenticity of the artist who brought it to life in the first place. And as the legendary Bobby Ausinski puts it, Jerry represented the new generation of engineers. He knew all the rules, but was perfectly willing to break them. And as a result, there's so much energy and magic captured in his records, which really did ignite and move people in real life. The music really translated through the speakers. That really happened. Jerry Finn just had a great way of bringing out the best in obviously the bands and the artists and the environments he was working in, but also the listeners that got to receive the music in the end. And sadly, this video is a posthumous one as Jerry passed unexpectedly in 2008. Even now, it still feels like a huge bummer as he wasn't too interested in the spotlight or doing a lot of interviews, so there's not a ton of direct information from him out there but his eagerness to build real relationships with the people around him and share his knowledge in real life wherever he could. And as we're about to discuss in his production process as a whole, Jerry's energy continues to leave a lasting impression. So now that we're a little more tuned in on who Jerry Finn is and the breadth of his work, let's discuss what we know about his actual process as a producer and engineer. The studios, the gear, and the techniques. As I mentioned earlier, he didn't do a ton of interviews when he was alive. However, he was well known to divulge any trick if anyone would ask. He was eager to share what he knew, he just really didn't want any of the spotlight. So as a result, what we know about Jerry's process is gathered from lots of deep dives into in-studio footage, the interviews he did do, blog posts, and from all the other people who appreciate his work to get a lot of this information in the first place. So big thanks to all of them. I'll make sure they're linked in the description below. So in terms of his production process, Jerry Finn was really big on a positive and productive environment. He was so good at creating the right conditions for music to transpire. As we learn in many interviews with bands he worked with, he knew how to make a band feel really good about themselves, while still leaving space to challenge them to be better. Arranging punk and rock songs was a gift he had from being in bands himself growing up. But overall, he just knew how to get parts to fit together and get out of the way of each other, which was his natural approach. Just don't get in the way of the music. Set it up for success and let it happen. 
And then the other big part of the equation was Jerry's attention to the sound itself in a way that wasn't just technically perfect, but made people feel really excited to play and put that energy back into their instruments, which I think is the most difficult blend to find. Jerry was known for being ultra meticulous with getting sounds dialed in, often spending days at a time on individual instruments. Obviously, time is a luxury, and a lot of these records were made in an era where there were bigger budgets and more time and money to make music. But even on the low budget records he worked on, bands still talk about how much time he would spend getting the exact right combination of things. Swapping heads, cabs, guitars, cables, strings, even down to trying different speaker cables at different lengths between heads and cabs. It's really funny that for such a punk rock guy, he was also such an audiophile, which is pretty awesome. We'll talk about the studios he worked in in a moment, but for Jerry, getting consistent sounds like this wasn't just about picking the right location every time. He actually had a massive personal library of awesome recording gear. The best, most tuned in Marshall and Mesa heads, his glorious Tenoy monitors, tons of pedals, apparently hundreds of guitars, as well as a very unique collection of outboard preamps and compressors. You can check out a lot of this in the old Reverb Store archive from an estate sale they had just a few years ago, and you'll basically be able to get an item by item rundown of the exact gear that he used on so many of these records. So he definitely had some tasty gear and he put it well to use. Furthermore, because it was his and he kept it mobile, it allowed him to spring up pretty much anywhere, including a random house in San Diego that Blink picked to record their self-titled release. Jerry just brought his gear in, set it up, and they made a really awesome record. So while we're talking about locations, let's talk about his studios of choice. As far as I can tell, Conway Studios in LA was Jerry's home away from home. He made or worked on in some part a ton of his music at Conway. I'm actually not sure if this place is still operational. Sometimes places like this go private for a while and judging from the website, it doesn't look terribly active, but nonetheless was a big part of Jerry's recording career. And one of the biggest records he did there was Enema of the State by Blink-182. He also worked at Sage and Sound, namely on some of the tracks for December Underground for AFI, Total Access Recording where he did a lot of About Time by Pennywise, a and also in LA for the songs he did with Suicide Machines, and last but not least, he made a bunch of music at Fantasy Studios in Berkeley, like the Job Wrecker and Rancid Records. Until I started working on this video, I didn't realize how much work Jerry was doing in the Bay Area, which as the place where I grew up and started my music pathway is really near and dear to me and it makes Jerry's journey that much more inspiring to me. So he worked all over, but honestly, if you gave that guy a Mackie and a microwave, he would make you something really special. But these are some of the studios he spent a lot of his time at. So with all that in mind, where's all the sound come from? How did he get these tones? How do you make guitars and drums and bass sound like this? Gear-wise, he always said there were two critical components to his chain, and that was tape and his knee, especially his BCM-10. Now, obviously, these two things together are going to sound amazing. And that's exactly it. He leaned on that without overthinking it. He trusted and knew that music paired with those elements 99% of the time was the right sound. And he was right. From there, his outboard collection was surprisingly clean. He favored a lot of manly gear, which definitely has some audible flavor, but is pretty clean when it comes to analog gear. He also loved Martek preamps, a favorite of Al Schmidt as well, someone definitely not known for making punk rock music, and things like Massenburg and NTI EQs, among other choices. Jerry also used a lot of Avalon preamps, including the 737, a personal favorite of mine, as well as some of the single channel units NDIs, not to mention a bunch of Chandlers like the Germanium Prees. What I love about his personal library is the under prevalence of things like 1176s and LA-2As. He certainly deployed a lot of standard stuff from his collection onto all the records he worked on, but for the most part, he was always setting himself up to get tones that were definitely different than what other people were trying to dial in. Close and similar so that it worked and felt accessible, but still polished, energetic, and different enough for the time. And now when it comes to any music, these are just some of the most timeless tones. He also believed strongly in keeping preamps as close to the microphone as possible keeping the shortest possible mic cable runs he could. You can definitely hear a difference, so, so I get where Jerry Finn was coming from with this. All of this meticulous tone searching definitely adds up. But even with his love for all that high-end gear and tweaking with this really nice stuff with really high-end cables to get the sounds that he wanted, he still had a soft spot in his heart for cheap budget gear. Jerry knew how to get great sounds from some of the most budget gear of all time. So overall, he kept a really wide spectrum of flavors available, ready to make any song or any tone come to life. Jerry also felt like the sound of modern records is the sound of compression. And as such, he was a big user of it for color, not just control. Jerry would set the attack slow and the release fast so that all the transients are always getting through and the initial punch is still there. But the release is instant as soon as the signal drops below the threshold. As Jerry said, that's the sound of my mixes. 
it keeps things popping the whole time. Now, when it comes to the sounds themselves, whether it's guitars or drums or bass or vocals, Jerry always started with big sounds. And though he spent a lot of time tweaking and making sure everything was right, he would still sum a lot of things down to one or two tracks, committing to his ideas and the tones that he got. The fact that he worked on tape so much definitely pushed these limitations, but it wasn't uncommon for him at any point in his career to have just a few tracks of guitars that mixed down, even though he had recorded tons of layers. And speaking of layers, that's one of the things he was an expert at introducing into a song without getting in the way of the song itself or making it very obvious to the listener that all these elements are coming in. But by the end of many of his songs in the last chorus, if you listen close, you can hear the wall of sound that's come forward. One of my favorite examples of this is at the very end of What's My Age Again by Blink-182 on the last hit, the last strum out. If you listen close, you can hear the guitars and bass ringing out, but it sounds like there's some layers from effects and definitely synths in there somewhere all kind of resonating together and you're like, wow, I didn't even know that was there. But if you then rewind a little bit and you listen to it, you can actually hear maybe some of those elements starting to come through, but not in any sort of way that gets in the way of the song. He was great at making sure that they found their way into a song naturally and still brought the energy that both the song and the artist were looking for. And last but not least, we cannot leave the discussion of his production technique without talking about how he recorded guitars and bass, about how he thought about them as a collective thing and was able to record and mix such great sounds that have really helped shape the sound of modern rock, not just the pop punk and punk rock records that he's so known for. When we talk about what makes Jerry Finn Records great, one of the things many people are talking about is his approach to making guitars and bass work so well together while still being super energetic and accessible. You have to remember that before Jerry Finn came along, the way you recorded punk rock and even a lot of rock music was to make it imperfect, to not polish the edges. Otherwise, you lose all the grit and the energy. But this is what he was a genius at. He was able to bring the pop without losing the punk in the process. And to this day, there's few things as satisfying as a Jerry Finn style guitar bass stack. And a big part of the sound was due to his constant use of blending a Marshall amp and a Mesa Boogie dual rectifier at the same time. That combination seems so obvious at this point in time. Of course you put a Mesa and a Marshall together. And Jerry Finn certainly isn't the first one to do that, or the only person to do that. But the way he did it so consistently made it a sound that you can almost always count on to really make guitars come together, feel heavy, but sit forward in a mix. And a big part of this is that Jerry Finn brought back the use of mids. His records, even though they're heavy and they feel modern, they're not super scooped. They've got a lot of mid-range punch, but they don't sound abrasive. For the frequency content of what we're talking about here, it's kind of spectacular that it feels that full spectrum at all. Let alone, in most cases, it feels like it's coming out of a PA and, just, and it's just knocking you in the chest. It's awesome. In terms of mics for a long time on those guitar amps, he was a 57 in condenser side-by-side -side kind of guy, usually like a U67. But as time went on, he swapped out his use of the 57 for a Royer 121 and eventually stopped using a U67 and began using Microtech Gefell large cap condenser in its place. He would always spend a ton of time finding the right place on a guitar cab for those mics, but they were almost always just a little left or right of center of the cone and two to three inches off the grill. Again, nothing groundbreaking but the palette that gave him to then dial in the rest of the equation, including the amps themselves, was set up by the foundation of those mic pairings. And even though he's a rock guitar player kind of guy, he was really aware of the role that bass plays in this equation, making sure that it was out of the way of the kick, but really filled in all of the space between there and the guitars, which ultimately make his guitar sound a lot throatier, and at the same time, help the mid-range of the bass be a little more pronounced. That punk rock snarl, that way it cuts through and isn't all rumbly and thuddy, especially like fast paced songs is really amazing. And that's the Jerry Finn sound. That bass sound is just iconic at this point. If you pull up any kind of like punk bass simulator, I think that Contact has one. That's the kind of sound that it's going for. So you definitely can't overlook the role that bass played in his recordings and how good he was at dialing that in as well. All right, so that's it. I hope this video was helpful and that in learning a little more about Jerry Finn and his production process, whether you were already aware of him or not, can help your own creative process. Whether you're a musician, an engineer, a producer, the way Jerry approached making things with such love and attention to his craft is truly inspiring. For me, Jerry's records have taught me a lot about how music is supposed to make people feel. I love that so many of his records were not just commercially successful, but forever resonated with real people and real humans across space and time. And you can still hear his influence today, especially in the newest Blink-182 record, One More Time, which for the most part is entirely self-produced with the band. Travis Barker, the drummer who led the production, recently said in an interview that he felt guided by Jerry throughout the entire process, 
constantly asking himself, what would Jerry do? And his legacy also lives on through the other engineers and producers he worked with. Guys like John Feldman and Ryan Hewitt, who Ryan Hewitt has also made some of the most important records to me in my life. So Jerry definitely lives on, and I thank you so much for tuning into this video and finding it. I also want to give a big thanks to all the bands that have talked about Jerry Finn in all of their interviews and shared what they learned from him in the process. Not to mention all the other YouTube channels and blogs that made a lot of content and gathered a lot of information to even give me a place to start with any of this. So I thank all of you so much. Thank you for sharing this. And it's a reminder that we're not here forever. And that if someone's making an impact on you, let them know that what they're doing is great. Share, share the flowers, right? Like it's not always about getting your own spotlight. It's also about giving it to you. And unfortunately, Jerry didn't grab very much of the spotlight while he had it. So I hope that as the time goes on, that his legacy can live on through us all sharing these great traditions of making records that he has passed on through us and you can audibly hear in any of his music that you put on. So thanks so much for watching. I'd love to see you again. Please drop a comment below on what your favorite Jerry Finn record is. And if you learned something along the way from Jerry Finn's production process, definitely drop that down below as well. So that's it for now. Please hit subscribe and like. I'd love to see you here again. Until next time, thanks so much. Bye-bye.